Uh, a little bit about us. One of the one of the things that we say often at Hermi, one of the reasons that we do what we do is we believe that what gets measured gets improved. That um, leaders tend to pay attention to numbers. And the numbers that they that are the ones that influence them. I'm getting a little bit of background noise. If I could ask everybody to mute themselves for a minute. Thank you so much. Um, so we believe that what gets measured gets improved and that leaders tend to pay attention to what gets measured and that's what they spend their time and their energy on. And if human rights are not being measured accurately and robustly, then it is difficult to convince leaders to make the changes that are needed to improve people's lives. So some of the things um, that are important to know about us, one is that we use co-design in everything we do. We're very conscious not to be just an organization coming in from outside um, other countries and imposing some um, outside standards or ways of doing things. Instead, um, for every piece of work that we do, we gather people together uh, from all over the world and from different kinds of backgrounds, uh, human rights practitioners, academics, um, and we, we work together to find out what is needed and how to provide it. And so all of the data that you're going to see today have been constructed and measured um, using uh, methodologies that, that uh, were produced by co-design methods. Um, we have a diverse global team. Uh, I'm based in New Zealand, but, um, but that's just, just me and a couple of the others. Um, we have one headquarters in New Zealand and one in the United States, uh, but we have team members all over the world. Um, and we, we recently have begun um, quite a large internship program, which includes uh, my colleague Sharon here today from Kenya. Um, so that has increased um, our, our range even further, which is um, it, we're really enjoying. Um, we, we, uh, we have all of our research peer reviewed. So the co-design process has meant that our research is well accepted uh, both in the, the human rights practitioner community and also in the academic community. And so all of our methodology and, um, and data have, have been looked at by other academics and, and approved as being robust and consistent and reliable. And, um, and very importantly, we're independent and we're not-for-profit. Uh, so we make all of our data freely available at rightstracker.org. Um, everything is, is available. You can even download the entire data sets. Um, and we are independent of all government influence. Uh, so we are here to be able to measure things that nobody else is able to politically. Um, often when we tell people that we measure human rights, they will say, but surely the United Nations does that already. Um, but in fact, the United Nations doesn't because the United Nations is um, a collection of countries who all have political interests to protect. Uh, and while the United Nations is the body where the agreements have been made, the treaties, the international covenants, um, the, the United Nations does not have the mandate to, um, to measure and quantify and put numbers to the progress of each country. And so that is a gap that we are filling. And we're able to do that because we are independent of governments. Um, and as journalists, you will understand very well um, how important that is. Our goal at Hermi is to equip the human rights community by measuring every right that exists in international law. Um, every right that countries have signed treaties about. Um, but that's an enormous job and we're starting uh, just with some of the most important. Um, and so, so far we are measuring eight, eight civil and political rights, or you could say eight collections of civil and political rights because several different rights are measured together. Uh, and uh, five economic and social rights. And uh, Sharon will be taking you through some of the sp specific data about both of those. And all the scores that we show you, you are able to check yourself. If you happen to have two screens available to you, you're welcome to go to rightstracker.org right now and look through the data for yourself, um, or you can note it for later. It's available in four languages so far. 
including French and Portuguese. So um, most most uh, journalists in Africa should be able to access the data in, in a language they understand well. Um, some of the reasons that we're here today, that Ken Day and Blessing have invited us, um, are about how, uh, how our, our data can be useful to investigative journalists. Um, and you, of course, will be the best people to tell us um, how our data are useful to you. So I put these, um, I put these to you as uh, ideas and suggestions, uh, but I will want to hear from you later on in the workshop uh, what you think about uh, what might be useful about what you're about to see. Um, but my guess is, and you're having worked with, with um, many journalists over the few years that I've been with um, the Human Rights Measurement Initiative, uh, my, my guesses are that our data can give you story ideas and I expect that as we show you the data today, that you will you will get some ideas immediately. You, you will see some numbers that make you think that needs to be reported on. Um, so I encourage you to, to have your notebook with you or your um, make some notes on your phone or computer as you go if, um, if some things occur to you. Um, secondly, our data can give high level context to a particular issue you are investigating. Um, so we don't we don't have um, an enormous amount of very granular detail. We don't have the very small details about what's going on in every country. We have the high level context, uh, which includes time time trends. So we have the context that says things are getting better or getting worse in a country for a particular right or for or for a particular group of people. Um, and so if you are reporting about something specific about um, an event that's happened where there was a rights violation, we can give the high level context to that. Um, we can give you hard numbers to put to powerful people. So if you are wanting to interview the, the Minister for Police, the Minister for Immigration, um, that someone who is um, who is responsible for making sure that children have access to schools. If you are wanting to um, hold powerful people to account, you can put numbers to them that they can't argue with. Um, so uh, our, our numbers are um, that they're hard numbers. These are things that have been measured um, using sophisticated statistical methods. Um, and we have a lot of backup and credentials that we can, we can put behind them so that when you walk into a room armed with our data, um, there are, you, you can uh, be asking these powerful people, um, forcing them to, to respond to what's really going on in your country and in their governance. Fourthly, you can show, and this is related to the second one, our, our data can help you show when news events are part of a trend. So if you're reporting on a single event, um, what, the data can make it possible for you to say, and this is not just a one-off occurrence, this is actually part of a larger trend. Um, so being able to give um, that context um, and some facts uh, to help back up an individual story uh, can be really useful. Um, and fifthly, as Kenda was saying, um, data can make your reporting more persuasive. Um, it can be, uh, our data can be another set of facts that you can draw on to help build a picture in your reporting. The two sets of rights that we measure um, this one is the most important if you are from Nigeria, uh, because at the moment, this is the set that we have data for, um, for, Ni for Nigeria. We have uh, scores, economic and social rights scores for around 200 countries, including Nigeria. Uh, so the way that we do things, we are measuring international treaty obligations. So the numbers that you see are a measure of how well the government is doing. They're not a measure of how well the people are doing. And so if we, if you, if we set, show you a score that says 50%, that's not the number of the population who are enjoying their rights. That's a score out of 100 for how well the government is doing compared to what it should be doing under international law. The international legal obligation for these rights, economic and social rights include things like the right to food, housing, health, education and work or, or income, those kinds of things. The obligation that each country has is according to its resources 
because of course we cannot expect the very poorest countries to have the same uh, level of health system or education system as the very richest countries. But each country does have an obligation to do its very best with what it has. Um, the language in the treaty and the international covenant is that countries are obliged to use the maximum available resources to make sure that people's rights are fulfilled. So we measure um, how well a country is doing compared to how well we calculate it should be doing given its income. And for our economic and social rights scores, every country should be getting around 100%. That's what we calculate as possible. And as you'll see soon when Sharon shows you the rights tracker, Nigeria, unfortunately, is, is one of many countries that is, is falling short of what we judge it could be able to do right now, just in terms of the economic um, resources that the country has. So we are judging um, the government performance. Uh, and this, of course, as journalists, is something that's really useful for you to be able to focus on when you are talking to um, to government ministers um, and other people in power to say that these are the government obligations to the people of Nigeria um, and there is room for some improvement. When we are calculating these, we start with data from international databases um, held by people like UNICEF or the FAO or the World Health Organization. We take um, those data that tell us, for instance, how many children are in school, how many children are growing well, um, what the life expectancy is, those kinds of indicator um, data. We take them and we put them through our methodology, uh, which relates the performance to the, um, the level of income of a country. So for the economic and social rights, we use a combination of data from international databases and our own statistical methodology. Uh, because we're taking data from international databases, um, we can only ma uh, make scores for countries who have given that data to the international organizations. So where there are gaps, it's because, um, because a country might not have supplied that data to the international organization that collects it. And as I said, we have, have data, at least some data for around 200 countries for these rights. For civil and political rights, which is things like freedom from arbitrary arrest and execution and freedom of speech and voting rights, those kinds of things, um, these things are not measured at all by anyone. They're monitored by, by many uh, excellent organizations, um, but no one is able to put a number to how well each government is doing at respecting these rights until the methodology that, that we helped develop um, in our co-design process with practitioners around the world. So we are the first to measure respect for these rights. And we do it using a secure, anonymous online survey of in-country human rights experts. Um, these are people like anyone working, for instance, for Amnesty or Human Rights Watch in the country or for local human rights uh, NGOs. Um, investigative journalists uh, are often eligible to participate in this survey. Um, giving their information from on the ground of what they think is going on, not in terms of specific events necessarily, but in terms of an impression of how well respected these rights are. Now, this is very labor intensive and expensive. And so we have so far been able to start measuring this in 40 countries. Um, and as soon as we have the funding, we can expand to the rest of the world. We've been adding countries every year. Um, but we need more funding to be able to expand to new countries. And so unfortunately, Nigeria is not yet in the sample. Um, but as soon as we have sufficient funding, particularly for, for say, the West Africa region, uh, we will, we're very much looking forward to being able to produce civil and political rights data for you. Um, what Sharon will show you is data for, we were thinking Liberia, as Blessing said, but we now think we'll show you um, the data for Angola, another oil rich nation, uh, which has been in our sample since the very beginning. So we have um, several years of data for them. So Sharon will show you a bit, um, uh, show you what, what will be to come for Nigeria. 
The Rights Tracker is where all of our data are, avail are available, rightstracker.org. And as I said, it's in four languages so far. Um, you can quote anything you see on the Rights Tracker. You can, um, it, everything is freely available under a Creative Commons license. So we just ask you, that you attribute us. Um, and you can use screenshots of our graphs in your reporting. Um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, again, just with attribution, you don't need to seek any other permission. Um, and our staff are available for interview. So if there are any um, details that you would like to um, discuss, or if you'd just like to get some quotes to include in your reporting, um, we would be delighted to help you with that. And as I said, we have uh, staff all over the world, so we'll be able to connect you with someone in the right time zone and someone with the right expertise. Um, I will put my email address in the chat box shortly, uh, and it will be um, on the screen later on as well. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm the communications hub, so um, any, any interview needs you have, you can email me directly, and you're most welcome to connect with me on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Um, and our staff are also available to help interpret the data. We, we know that our data are complex, um, so Sharon's going to give you an introduction to them shortly. Uh, but there, you know, there's a lot of detail. I've been working with Hermi for two and a half years, and I'm still learning. Um, so. Uh, we are very, very happy to spend half an hour on a call with you um, going through the particular data that you would like to use in any article that you're doing or any reporting. Um, so please do just get in touch and we would be delighted to, um, to go through things with you to, to make sure that you're getting everything you need from it. So now I am going to hand over to Sharon, who's going to shortly um, share her screen. Uh, and um, show you what the rights tracker looks like on her phone. And I thought that would be quite useful because many of you will be using your phones on the go as you're um, doing your reporting. Um, while she is uh, showing you the rights tracker uh, for Nigeria and then for Angola, um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. So do please put questions in. We'll stop for questions to be spoken later on as well, but do feel free to put questions in the chat box and I may be able to give you a quick answer just while Sharon's talking. Um, so do feel free to do that. And so I will now stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to Sharon. And Sharon, you might like to introduce yourself a bit further as well. Okay. Thank you, Talia. Welcome. Welcome all this morning. Uh, my name is Sharon Muriuki. I am an intern at Hermi, and I also practice law here in Kenya. Just to say that at Human Rights Measurements Initiative, we are looking for African participants. So please share this data with everybody in Nigeria and in West Africa, and, to and tell them to join us as, as interns. They will learn a lot. So I'm going to share my screen. I will be taking you through the rights tracker, how we measure the rights, the rights on our, our data. I'm going to present it to you today. So I'm using my phone because most of us here in Africa use our phones for our daily lives. So I'll show you how we use it. So you type rightstracker.org on your browser. And I'm now sharing my screen. That is our rights tracker. Perfect, we can see that. Yes, uh, uh, we measure our data in three ways, through rights, countries, and people. It's available in the following languages, in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and, Fran and, and French, sorry. So, and those are three languages, the four languages that are actually spoken on the African continent. Uh, yes, so for today, I'm going to show you data on the quality of life rights in Nigeria. So we'll come to the search bar and type Nigeria. And we search. So we start, Talia said that what gets measured gets improved. So we want to see how well Nigeria is, is in respecting human people, people's human rights. So we have the tabs, as you can see on my screen, about Nigeria. We have data for the quality of rights, economic and social rights in, on food, health, housing, and work. We don't have complete data on education. So we cannot give you a summary score on the quality of life rights at the moment. But when we get funding and we finish that, we will have a complete score. 
So we, uh, we, we don't have data for Nigeria for safety from the state. These are civil and political rights and empowerment rights. The safety from state rights, you can see are rights, freedom from arbitrary arrest, disappearance, death penalty, extrajudicial execution and torture. And the empowerment rights are the rights to assembly and association, the right to opinion and expression and the right to participate in government. And I believe as journalists, these, the, the empowerment rights affect you 100%. So, we go to the quality of rights, right? Uh, the quality of life, right? And from the data we have, a summary, Nigeria is performing worse than average. And why do we say that? Because Nigeria is a signatory. We are we in, in this right, Nigeria is a, is a ratified, ratified the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 1993. And that right uh, calls on Nigeria to do to allocate the maximum resources available to ensuring that those rights are met. So we I want to show you the details of this right. So what what is it? What, what how do we measure quality of rights lives? We used to benchmark the income adjusted and the global best. But we use the income adjusted because this is what the covenant, I'll call it the covenant now, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights calls for. It calls for states to allocate maximum resources to ensure that this right is met. And we measure it at a, at a rate of 100%. So how is Nigeria doing to ensure that this right is met? I'm going to take to to use the bar to show you how we, we calculate. So we are going to take the right to uh, right to food because I, uh, I am very interested in food security. The indicators we have for Nigeria are for children not stunted. And we can desegregate this further by step. So the right to food by sex and the right to food, the overtime, the overtime measurement over the past 10 or so years, the right to food. So we come back on top and we can see that on the right to food, Nigeria, Nigeria's government is only doing 40.2% of what is expected of it. So this is a good this is a good measurement to put in your article because we expect countries to do more. The target is a hundred. We expect countries to do a hundred. So a forty point two percent is actually below average, and it means that the government uh, needs to be pressed, and the minister in charge of agriculture or food needs to have this data on his table so that Nigeria can act. We also have the right um, a, a percentage on 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 a disaggregated data on say on gender gender so female in Nigeria it, females as calculated against the whole world Nigeria is doing sixty point two percent with regards to ensuring that it's females. That and we we remember these are children not stunted at a growth at sixty point two percent and the males at fifty three point seven percent and more importantly over the years how is how has Nigeria been doing to ensure that the right to food is achieved? You can see the chart the chart from say two thousand and eight to twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen Nigeria is actually. I don't know, it's going down, the, the chart is uh, going down. The graph is showing that less is being done. A apart from a few years of improvement, we are really, in Nigeria, we are not really doing well. So we, we pray that uh, you put this, the, the, the data into you, uh, to the people concerned in Nigeria, you report on it, on the right to food. And if you, Say you want to search for the right to housing, you use the same method. 
Nigeria is only doing 32.1, the, the government of Nigeria is doing 32.1% to achieve the, 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 right, the goal of the right to housing for all Nigerians. You can see the indicators for this we use, as explained by Talia, basic sanitation at 40.0% and water in the houses at 24.3%. By sex, let's see whether we have data. In the right to housing, we don't. And uh, over time, uh, the right to housing. The right to housing. Uh, there's um, a line on the graph that shows that it has remained the same over the, more or less the same over the past 12 years or so at 40.2%. So this is also data that you can put to the ministry in charge and report that Nigeria is doing below average to ensure that these rights are being met. So we can search for Nigeria in comparison. Well, we, we, we want to see how Nigeria is doing in comparison with other countries. So we, we, we can go back to the right to say the right to house, the right to food. Let's go to the right to food for, for all countries. We have scores for 128 countries across the world, but since we want to measure at home in Africa, we can filter this and uh, we use, um, we're in Sub-Saharan Africa. So let's see how Nigeria is doing as compared to countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. You can see that the DRC is doing the government of, it does not mean that 98.6% of the people in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, have food. It shows that the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo is doing 98.6% of what is expected of it to make sure that this right is achieved. So let's see where Nigeria is in this data, in this page. You can see where Nigeria is. That from bottom, and this is data for, sorry, this is data for 45 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Nigeria is only doing 40.2% even at home, only 40, the, gov the, the government is only allocating, is only doing 40.2% of what is available. We know Nigeria can do it, but the government is only doing 40.2% of what it can do to make sure that we have everybody getting the right to food in Nigeria, achieving the, the right to food. We can also add another filter. Nigeria is a member of the, Organization of Islamic Countries. So let's see, we disagree, disagree, the data further. These countries are in Nigeria in Sub-Saharan Africa and the OIC. And in this data, Nigeria is actually bottom of the, of the list at 40.2%. So on the right to food, we, this is the data we have, and we believe that by your reporting and getting in touch with the ministries, both at state level and the federal government level, we will be able to improve the, 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 the right situation in Nigeria. That is only the right food. So uh, I will also show you how we track the civil and political rights. Uh, we wanted to do Angola because we have been doing this for a while for Angola and Angola like Nigeria is an oil producing state and a very strong country economically, just like Nigeria. So we will search Angola on the search bar. Here we go. This is Angola. Um, on the quality of rights, uh, the economic and social rights I uh, have just explained for Angola, we have the summary score of 45.2%, which we do not have for Nigeria because we don't have data on education. So this is Angola. We have data on the five safety from state rights 
and the three empowerment rights. For, for this, it's easier when you come and click the tab on the people at risk. Here we go. And because we have journalists with us this morning, we will select a group, journalists. If this was Nigeria, this is what would appear on your screen. So we have data for everyone, the quality of life. These are the economic and social rights, but you want to check the, the civil and political rights. So let's see. We are here. The safety from state rights. Talia has already explained how we gather data on this. And for this, uh, the, you can see from the screen, the larger the text, the more human rights experts identify this group as being at risk. So the, journal, the, the, the human rights experts we, we, that provided reports in Angola show the, all these people, actually, let me, the, let me say that all these people are all at risk of having the, these rights violated, but the more people at risk in Angola of having their right to freedom from arbitrary arrest, uh, these rights uh, abused are the, the, the members of labor unions at a higher band of, at a higher band than say, People with specific medical conditions. So the higher, the, the larger the text, the more the, the risk. And journalists, we have already filtered journalists in, like, in Angola, sorry, at 31%. Uh, the, the, in freedom from disappearance, the journalists actually top this survey at 19%. Freedom from death penalty. Now, here, uh, here we, we like Angola does not practice death penalty, so this score is actually ten. We give a band of zero to ten. So this this score, I will show you the bands later. This score is actually ten because death penalty. We don't we 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 didn't have the expert selecting group, but for countries that do not carry out the death penalty, this is actually usually a score of ten. At, uh, with, with the larger the text here, we don't have data for journalists, but on the right to freedom from torture, the human rights expert interviewed and those who provided reports. For all these people are at risk of torture, but journalists are at 31%. And on the right, uh, the empowerment rights, they are, also, they are still civil and political rights. Uh, the right to assembly and association, forming journalist union, uh, trade trade unions, unions to labor unions. Sorry, uh, our our experts identified that eight percent journalists are, are, are at that eight percent of of having this right violated. Their risk is at that eight percent. The right to opinion and expression. I believe the, the, the participants in this uh, seminar today are human rights advocates and journalists. And in Angola, 50% of, of the data we have shows that journalists have, are at risk of having this right violated. So at the top two of, the, of all these people, of all these respondents, and the right to participate in government, journalists top this, this, this at 44%. They are at a higher risk than say, people with less education, but everybody on this list, I'll keep insisting, is at risk of, ha of having this right violated. So let's go back to, let's, let me show you the bounds, the, the safety proof state. You can see it starts from zero to 10, and on the safety from state, Angola is at 5.3. 5.3 meaning there it's average. 
as you, the data has been disagree, disaggregated. Uh, the death penalty that I was explaining earlier, if the, a country does not, does not have this sentence in their criminal laws, it automatically gets a 10 on the band. And um, the narrower the band, the narrower the band, the more respondents with similar answers. The wider the band, we have fewer respondents and uh, divergent answers. So Angola is on a sample of 28 countries that we, we did, uh, we got reports from, from the, 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 the groups we get reports from as Talia reported. So yes, that is what we have. So for us today is to try to get funding so that uh, our participants today, our Nigerian human rights journalists, uh, reporters can give us data so that we can make this a table like this for Nigeria because for Nigeria as you saw let me show you for Nigeria it is we do not have we do not have data on this so Nigeria again let's go back to Nigeria we don't have data on the civil and political rights for Nigeria so we would love to Nigeria is a very important country in Africa and we'd love to measure those rights. So I'm sure by the end of our webinar today, we will have, um, we will know how to move forward on it. So thank you for that. Thank you, Talia. Thank you, Blessing. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Sharon, for but taking us through uh, the data, the right tracker basically and assessing the various um, data that we can access and work with as journalists. I'm very sure at some point we want, oh, data, data, data here and there, but there are quite things that help us, the visit help our work. And when you are reviewing the part of the food, rights to food, I, I saw that, that's why the fact that it was declining, women still have access to more food. And I was like, oh, so does it mean we may eat more? <laughs> <laughs> That's just actually on the lighter note. But of course, you know that uh, women are also, uh, in some cases, are um, half of the considered half of the population. So yeah, um, I would want maybe um, <clears throat> Talia to take our session next. Then we can have questions or comments. Oh, Talia, what do you think? Yes, yeah, I think I think now would be a good time to to stop for questions. Uh, we've got we've got plenty more to show you and to talk about, um, but with, that's Sharon's given you a great overview of the kinds of things that are available on the rights tracker. Um, but we're aware that uh, there's a lot of detail there, and um, and a lot of it is quite new uh, in terms of how we do the measurements and what they are trying to say. Um, so let's pause now for some questions. Uh, do feel free to speak your question or to put it in the chat box, whichever suits you. Um, and I'll, I'll just be silent for a minute while um, I give some space for people to ask some questions. Um, thank you, Talia. So um, anyone who has a question, you can either raise your hand or talk directly or use the chat box to indicate your question. Um, Kaylee, you may want to lead. And I would be very happy to share my screen and go through the data in detail. So if there is something that you would like to go back to that you saw from Sharon's presentation, um, if you want to ask a question about housing or the gender um, divisions, anything you'd like, um, just speak up now. Speak up now, more like the slang that was used during the entire protest in Nigeria. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we expect our colleagues to share their questions, comments, maybe just um, a few comments on it, on some of the data that has been shared. And maybe while we wait for others to, to talk, earlier when we had the pre-meeting, the pre-training session with Italia, I talked about uh, this data, uh, there's gender disaggregation of data. And I also talked about disability disaggregation of this data. Maybe you might want to address that, uh, for a larger audience, while others also share their questions. 
Yeah, certainly. I, in fact, I've got a couple of um, slides and some resources that I'm going to share. So I'll just hold that over. I think that's a really important question, Blessing. I'm just going to hold that over for a few minutes. Um, can I ask everybody if you can, um, if you can access your chat box to just write in the chat box either a question or something that you found was interesting or surprising or useful or confusing um, about the data that you've seen so far. So just anything that you can say that was interesting um, or that you uh, that caught your eye. So if everyone could just put in just one short sentence into the chat box um, or ask a question, then that would be great. So I see the first question um, from Michael. Uh, what is the time frame of the data collected, especially from Nigeria? Now that's a really good question. Uh, so we we have data for the last uh, twenty years, uh, and we put the most recent ten years data on the rights tracker, um, are publicly available. Uh, so it's the most recent uh, ten years of data available. It does say twenty seventeen on the rights tracker because that is the most recent available. Um, the data all has to go through international databases before it gets to us. So um, for instance, when it's the, the rate of child stunting, that information has to be collected by local organizations within say Nigeria. Uh, and then the Nigerian, maybe the Department of Health or the Department of Statistics uh, gathers all the data for the whole country and sends it off to UNICEF or the World Health, Health Organization or whichever organization, um, global organization is collecting and harmonizing the data. And then when it arrives there in, in Rome or Geneva or wherever their headquarters are, um, they then spend um, another year uh, processing the data and making it available to the rest of the world. So by the time it gets to us, it's it's sort of two years since it was collected. And then we do our analysis and publish it as soon as we have it. Um, so that's the, that's the most recent available. Um, another question, uh, Candice is how can journalists contribute to the data? So uh, the, the economic and social rights data most of it comes, um, as I said, from international databases. So we don't we don't have other input. Um, we just take the numbers and we do the calculations and we put the facts out. Um, but the the people at risk um, sections, those word clouds that showed how many, uh, what kinds of groups of people are more at risk of uh, violations, that data comes from our survey which is done at the moment in 40 countries. As soon as that survey comes to Nigeria, then we would love for all of you to participate and share your knowledge through the survey, um, showing, uh, telling us who you say is most at risk and answering further questions about civil and political rights um, and about how common it is, for instance, for government agents to engage in acts of torture or ill, Ill treatment, um, how common it is for there to be violations of freedom of expression in the, in the most recent year. We do it a year at a time. Um, so uh, Atinuke, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I'll be pronouncing anybody's names correctly. I will do my best. Um, I think you've, you're asking the same question as Michael, um, saying that 2017 is the most recent. Uh, yes, that's the most recent that is available to anyone in the world. There is no more recent data. Um, so uh, we every year we update it. Uh, when we update, put our next update out in a couple of months time, it'll be the 2018 um, story that we are able to tell. Um, so we're always going to be a little bit behind because it takes a long time for the international organizations to publish the data that we use. Thanks everybody, those are great questions. Um, as a social development professional, yes, the data do need to be broken down. Yes, that's quite right. Um, I, uh, I'd love to talk, well, I will talk a bit more about the disaggregation. Um, and uh, we will need to, yeah, and we'll talk about um, whether it um, answers your question in a, in a little bit. And can, there, can journalists share their human rights story based on their work in Nigeria with us for use? Uh, so the, um, the pathway for information to come from a journalist to us is through the survey. Um, and the survey, it's a, you know, it's a very, it's a technical kind of survey. It's the same in every country. Um, it, we, we don't just take um, individual stories from different people. We have a, you know, a, a very careful process. Um, so that's not, uh, that's not available in Nigeria yet. 
Um, now it is just dependent on funding. We are perfectly ready to come to Nigeria as soon as someone will fund us to do it. Um, it costs around 20 or $30,000 a year for any country to be in the survey, um, just in terms of uh, the, the number of staff who need to work on the science and on the infrastructure and on and the communication. Um, so uh, if you have any rich friends who want to um, see better data in Nigeria, then just let us know. Um, and we, we need to, um, we like to expand to a region at a time, a region or a sub-region, so perhaps all of West Africa. Um, so we would need to, to get funding for a few countries at a time. Um, and you we're ready to do it tomorrow as soon as as soon as we have funding we have we have all of the infrastructure ready um, and we're currently working in 40 very different countries all around the world um, so we're very very keen to to partner with you as soon as um, we have the funding uh, so Ayodele says what's the process of working together to come up with relevant data um, how can we work to get it done it is just funding so we have all of the methodology sorted we have all of the processes in place um, but it is a very expensive process um, and we, we are at capacity. Um, all of our staff are working um, a lot of unpaid hours um, and uh, in overtime and we're just um, looking forward to, to um, having enough funding to expand so that we can bring, up, bring the survey to Nigeria and produce more data for you. So I'll just um, pause for another half a minute and see if uh, more questions come. Or if I haven't answered your question or haven't understood it correctly, then do please, please um, add some more clarification. Uh, would anyone like me to, to um, share my screen with the rights tracker and look at any more of those bits and pieces in detail? If you have a request, then um, now's a good time to make it. Kenda says, uh, can we work with data gathered by NGOs? Um, so for, for economic and social rights, a lot of the data is collected by NGOs, uh, and then it, it, but it has to go through the international databases to get to us, um, because it has to, we, we need to know that um, the data we're using is exactly the same from every country using the same measurements. So for instance, um, if we're talking about um, child stunting we need to know that it's up to five years old in every country rather than measuring some up to four years old and some up to six years old in different countries so that's why it goes through the international databases before it gets to us so that it's all harmonized and um, and verified uh, so we don't we don't work directly with whoever is supplying the data on the ground um, when it comes to the civil and political rights uh, yes very many of our survey respondents will be working with NGOs we ask people to respond in their personal capacity. We don't ask for any NGO to give a, a sort of a company response, an organization official response. We ask instead for as many people as possible from each organization to complete the survey, giving their impressions. Um, it's, a very, um, it's a very carefully thought out survey so that we can make sure that everyone's answers are comparable um, so that, you know, we do a, quite a lot of sort of statistical magic on it to make sure that we can produce data that is comparable across different countries and between different people's answers um, and over time. Um, so uh, when we are able to expand to Nigeria, we would, we would love to have all of you become survey participants. Um, we will pause for more questions um, shortly. So uh, if you have more questions, then please feel free to put them in the chat box now or later. Um, and uh, now I'll just go through a, a few more ways that you can use our data and a few more um, details. Um, so one feature um, on the rights tracker is that when you go to the page, so you saw Nigeria and Angola, this is the you know, screenshot just from the United States. Um, when you go to um, the rights tracker uh, at a glance page, there's an option to download a PDF report. Um, and so I point this out because it might be quite useful when you are trying to put questions to, uh, to government ministers and staff, um, because 
uh, you might want to send in advance um, the, the PDF download, which, you know, is sort of looks, looks official. Um, it's nicely presented. Uh, and it means that they don't need to go and look at the um, the scores themselves. They don't need to go and follow any links. You can just provide the data right in their hands um, and say, these are the scores that I want to be asking you my questions about. Um, so do check out the, the PDF download um, function on the rights tracker. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, how to get more specific data. And this is um, this is what Blessing was asking about, and I think someone else as well. Um, so uh, the economic and social rights data that we give you is for the entire country. Um, and obviously there will be smaller groups within the population who are having different experiences, um, particularly some minorities who are having much worse experiences. I would say that for the Nigerian data, for the scores that Nigeria has right now, they all fall into the band that we have, we've um, labeled, a, uh, to give you a bit of an indication, we've labeled very bad. Um, and so it, we know that um, some minorities and some groups that you will be able to name, I'm sure, will be doing even worse than the general population. Um, but the scores as they stand, I think, tell a, a powerful story. Um, if, you, if you have access, if you're a data journalist kind of person, and you can find the indicator data that matches the indicators that we're using. So for instance, for the right to food, the child stunting rate under five, you know, a very specific definition. Um, if you can find that data that's disaggregated in any, uh, for any other group. So it might be the child stunting rate for under five-year-olds in uh, rural areas versus urban areas, or it might be by disability status. Um, or it might be by gender. We, we have the, the basic gender um, breakdown for some of the rights, but not all of them. Uh, maybe by ethnicity or by uh, other uh, group, or maybe by region, maybe by state or province. Um, if you have access to those data, then you can compute HERMI scores for all of those groups. And so you'll be able to say the score for the right to food for Nigeria is 40.2%. But the score for this region of Nigeria is actually much worse. It's 15.2% or, or something like that. Um, the way that you do that is, um, is by using the calculator that's available on our website. And shortly I will put the uh, link to it um, and some extra resources in the chat box. Um, and if this, uh, so I, I'm going to put some instructions in the chat box, um, some files. Uh, and uh, for some for some people, this will be um, exactly the kind of thing that you would love to get your teeth into. For some people, as uh, as one of you mentioned earlier, um, this is not at all accessible to just the ordinary person who does not work with statistics and databases. Um, and I think this is the job of, I guess, of journalists um, and of um, and of researchers to do that disaggregation work. And, and put it out. Um, it's, it's the kind of work that we can do, uh, again, if we have more funding. So uh, the New Zealand Human Rights Commission, for instance, has contracted us to disaggregate um, the right to housing, health and education data in New Zealand for a range of groups, um, for ethnic groups and by age and uh, by um, urban and rural. I can't remember what they all are. I'm not on the team doing it. But, um, but that's the kind of thing that we could, we could do um, as a contract uh, for any organisation that wanted it. So if there is a human rights institute in Nigeria that would fund that work, then we could certainly produce it all. Um, we make it available so that anyone else can do the the producing without us, uh, if you have the skills. Um, and if you, um, if you know what you want, uh, but you're finding it just a little bit tricky to, to make it all work, then we are very happy to help you. If you have a particular story and you, what, and you know that there is some data available, um, but you're just finding it a little bit complicated, then please get in touch. And um, one of our staff, one of our, maybe one of our interns or one of our team members would be very happy to just walk you through the process and help you find the data that you need. Um, there's another, another way of, um, another kind of um, extra data that we have started um, computing. And again, <laughs> I keep saying when we have more funding, but this is the story of working for any non-for-profit organization, as I'm sure many of you will be aware. Um, but this is another thing that we are seeking funding for right now is to make 
the information I'm about to talk about available on the rights tracker for all countries. So Nigeria was actually the very first country that we did this work for, and we've published it on our website, and I'll put the link in the chat box shortly. Um, so what we have done is to, um, and this might address the question that came earlier about it, this not being accessible. Um, what we have done is turn our percentages of our scores into um, how, many, how many more people's lives would be improved if, if the government did better. And so we've looked at the difference between say 40.2% for the right to food. And let's imagine if Nigeria got 100%, which is what we calculate Nigeria could do with its current level of wealth. If tomorrow, suddenly, Nigeria changed how it was running its spending and running its economy and running its social systems and the agriculture department, all, those, all the things it would need to do to change, and suddenly it was doing so well that it got 100%, and we've turned that into things like this. If Nigeria, oh, sorry, I thought I was able to click there. If Nigeria were to operate at its full potential, given its current resources, we would expect an additional 12 million children under five to grow well and not be stunted. So we've turned our scores into numbers of people in, in Nigeria. Um, these are just some of the examples and we have more on our website. Um, when we think about um, child survival, which is for the right to health, we would expect an extra 3.6 uh, million children to reach their fifth birthday. When it comes to sanitation and water, um, if Nigeria got a 100% score, if it spent its resources um, effectively and got 100%, then that would mean an extra 122 million people in Nigeria would have access to basic hygienic sanitation on their premises. And another 143 million people would have access to water in their homes. When it comes to our measure of work and income, the right to work, the right to income, we look at absolute poverty for Nigeria. And, and the score shows that if Nigeria moved to 100% score, it could lift 118 million people out of absolute poverty. Um, and, and these are these are powerful numbers, I think. Um, and these are uh, wonderful dreams to have for every country. To, to be able to visualize the number of people um, whose lives could be improved if governments focused more on um, fulfilling people's human rights. And lastly, for education, if Nigeria, Nigeria were using its resources effectively, if the government were using its resources effectively, an extra 9.3 million primary school children would be enrolled. So I'm going to pause the kids just for a minute, um, and um, and I'm going to pause both to put some uh, links in the chat box and to pause for questions. So um, can I ask you to pop in the chat box anything that you're interested in that we've been talking about, or any questions you have, and I will put some links in for you. I'm going to um, upload some files, some uh, Word documents. Um, now these will disappear uh, when the workshop finishes. So I encourage you to download them if you can, um, but also uh, uh, they're all available. Um, oh, actually these ones, yeah, these ones you would need to email me for, uh, but I would be uh, very happy to be emailed. Um, if you would like to, if you don't get them today, if you're on your phone and you can't download them, um, then feel free to just uh, email me later on. So I'll just explain um, what I've put in the chat box. Um, so first I've just given you the rights tracker address for easy access. 
Um, the, the, then the next link is the HOMI calculator. Um, so that will take you to a page on our main website, not our rights tracker, but just our general information website. Um, and there you'll be able to download a file, an executable file, um, to do the calculations yourself. Um, it's, it's in beta, we're just developing it now, it will become a lot easier to use than it is now. Um, so be warned that it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not as uh, easy to read as our rights tracker yet. Um, but also in the chat box, I've uploaded some files. And so the first one says calculator guide. Um, that's a guide with screenshots that's been written by one of our team members um, who uses it all the time. Um, and so he's just written a sort of one and a half page Word document saying, first you do this, then you click on this button, then you grab this, and then you with just tips like that. So um, it, we're trying to make it as, as easy as possible for people to, um, to make these calculations by themselves. Um, but as I said, we're very happy to help um, if once you look at that, you, you think that you're going to need a little bit more assistance. Then the next link I've put in is um, the link to the uh, country spotlight on Nigeria, which has those population figures, the number of million children who would be able to go to school, for instance. Um, and uh, we calculated those quite recently, uh, la last year, but within the current data. So those those figures are, um, are current and you are welcome to quote them. You could put them in, a, in an article tomorrow and um, it would be uh, accurate and up to date. Uh, and we can recalculate them when our, when our data is updated um, in a few months. Um, if you want to create those kinds of population figures for yourself, um, for, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you don't need to now because we've done it for Nigeria, uh, but if you want to do it for another country, and um, we did it as an example just for a few countries, um, but it's not available otherwise, we have to do it all manually. But um, the one, the file that says recipe, um, that is uh, a recipe for how to create those population figures, a step-by-step -step set of instructions. Um, and that's been created by one of our team members, Livy, uh, Livy Mitchell, um, and she uh, she has created a Stata code. So if any of you are used to using the program Stata, um, then she is very happy to be contacted and you can get her Stata code to make it um, much faster. Um, and if that means nothing to you, don't worry. But for some people, if that means something to you, then that's a very helpful thing. Uh, and the last two files, are, if you're going through that process, it's just some template documents um, to make the process a little easier. So does anyone have questions at this point? All right, well, I will go on to the last bit that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, and do feel free to put questions in the chat box. Um, in terms of story ideas, uh, and other ways that you might want to um, consider using our data. Um, the SDGs are obviously very important uh, of different, differing importance in different countries, perhaps depending on how much your country is focusing on them. But the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, uh, you know, the, the goals that, that the UN, uh, that every country in the UN is working towards. Um, I, I know that there are a lot of NGOs that are very active in Nigeria. Now, our indicators do line up with the SDG indicators and overlap in lots of ways. And so if a, if a country is trying to reach one of the SDGs, um, looking at our scores um, can give some insights into uh, where improvements can be made. Um, the SDGs don't take income into account though, and, and, and we do, which is where there's a, an extra layer of usefulness. So um, we are able to say where, the, where there is room for improvement even without increasing wealth. So when there is a gap between the score and 100% for the economic and social rights, that says that, um, that improvements can be made even without increased um, income in a country, even without increased national income. Um, and so I mean, that, that's, there's a real good news story in that, in a sense, um, that improvements really are within reach. Um, and so when you're looking at um, how to reach the sustainable development goals, for countries where their scores are at near 100, um, those countries are not going to be able to improve further without more uh, income. 
And so we saw, for instance, earlier that the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, had, had a very high score for the right to food. Um, but I'm sure we will all not be surprised um, if, we, if we saw that the right to food was not, in fact, uh, at all well realised for, for people in, in DRC, um, that, that hunger is still a problem. Um, what the score tells us is that when the DRC is trying to reach the, the sustainable development goal of ending hunger, it is going to need more income to do that. It is already doing all it can in order to, um, to, to try and make sure that people have the right to food realised. Um, and, uh, and it's being restricted by its resources. Whereas the story for Nigeria is very different. This, Nigeria is not restricted by its resources. Um, it could do extremely well uh, for all its people if its resources were being um, used, used effectively by the government. Um, we can also use the overtime graph to show progress towards the SDGs. Um, if you if you look at the the time trends, when you see that you know the ten years of whether there is actually progress at the moment, or whether things have fallen or are are going flat, that will that will tell you a lot about how likely it is that um, any particular government department is is going to reach the goal that it's set. Um, the people at risk information for countries that are in the survey will also help um, identify um, where there are gaps and which people are missing out for the SDGs, particularly when we look at gender and other vulnerable groups. Um, COVID-19, of course, is impacting human rights in all directions. Um, our current survey, again, for countries that are in the survey, uh, has um, extra questions this year, uh, specifically about COVID-19. So we're going to be releasing that data in June this year. Um, and uh, so we won't have that data for Nigeria, uh, but if you're interested in other countries around the world, and we have four countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, um, then you might want to keep in touch with us um, so that you can see when that data comes out. Uh, and as soon as Nigeria gets in the survey, then we'll be able to produce that data for Nigeria as well. I imagine the COVID, um, COVID questions may be relevant for some years. For focusing on gender, I just want to draw your attention to um, the, the gender disaggregation that we have um, that Sharon showed you uh, for the rights to education, um, food and health. Uh, we have um, data available by, by male and female. Um, and we're not comparing uh, men with women or boys with girls. We're comparing how well the, the country is doing for its girls with how well it's doing for its boys. Um, and the scores are computed to compare um, the country's performance for girls with every other country's performance for girls and the country's performance for boys with every other country's performance for boys. Uh, survey countries, um, for those of you who are interested in gender, uh, then we have extra information and the people at risk. Um, and also, if you're, if you're um, particularly interested in gender, one of our health measures is reproductive health, which is obviously um, gender specific. Um, we, uh, I, I'm wrapping up now and we'll just have general questions. Um, but certainly in the future, uh, we would love to expand our survey to Nigeria. Um, and the, the things that we need to do that are, um, are funding and um, ambassadors, where we have uh, partners within Nigeria who are able to help connect us to potential survey respondents. Um, we also have internships that we are running at the moment, um, a range of different kinds of arrangements. And I'll put, the, I'll put some um, links in the chat box. So Sharon is one of our interns. She's been interning with us. Um, for not even that long, actually, and here she is doing a presentation to all of you um, because she's so wonderful. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we really would love uh, more uh, interns from, um, from Nigeria. We have our first one lined up to begin in a few weeks, um, but we'd love more. So if you happen to know any, particularly students, um, and particularly students who need to do um, work experience for their, for their degrees, um, anyone who's working in economics or law or journalism or uh, uh, social science uh, or politics or human rights, um, then we would love to host them. Um, the internships are primarily a learning experience 
um, when people stay with us for the if they stay for the for the minimum period of 12 weeks then um, it tends to be that that they are doing a lot of learning and uh, we're focusing on their learning rather than on trying to get them to do work for us um, but uh, certainly over time uh, uh, interns are able to do some some real you know like real live uh, real world important work for instance giving workshops to human rights journalists in Nigeria um, we're also as I said um, aiming as an organization to measure all the rights in the world uh, for all the countries in the world um, so some of the new work streams that we are hoping to launch um, soon uh, include some special specialty streams on child rights and women's rights and indigenous indigenous rights and others uh, so if you happen to know someone who is an expert in child rights or, or a specific area, disability rights, and really wants to be part of helping us get the work started, um, then please uh, get in touch. We would love to, to talk with anybody who's interested. Um, and let me emphasize that we are here to help. Um, we can uh, run workshops like this or tailored to particular circumstances for any nonprofit organization. Um, if you are part of a different journalism network in another country or a region or a specialty, um, then do feel free to get in touch. Um, we can help you with your reporting anytime. This is my email address. Um, it's a lot of different letters, so I encourage you to copy it carefully and I will put it in the chat box, um, spelt carefully. Um, so uh, I, I'm available anytime and I would love to hear from you. Uh, do please uh, get in touch anytime. Um, the, the offer to help is, is very genuine. That is, that's pretty much the end of what I have to say to you and what Sharon has to show you. Um, but we do have uh, more time available to have a general conversation. Um, I would love to answer any more questions that you have. I'd also like to hear from you um, about what's been useful and, and what hasn't, what else you would like to know, um, and about what, um, what practical use you think that our data might be in your reporting. Um, I'd love to hear if you have some story ideas now, um, or if there's any other way that we can help you. So over to everybody now. You actually Thank need you, to Tanya. see the water. <laughs> okay, you can go ahead, Kende. I was just saying, yeah, it's really been a long stretch. So that I need to take some warm, cool water, right? I guess. That's right. Okay, so we would want our colleagues to uh, see based on the data that has been shared uh, so far that we've run through. Um, perhaps there are some story ideas or something you wanted to work on that you feel you, um, the data that has been shared would help you to work on your story. Or maybe you didn't even have the idea before now, but seeing data, you feel, oh, this is what I can do that I can work on. And you don't know if Talia has some fonts. <laughs> to support your story and reports. I know journalists like hearing that. But I have a, um, um, we can just share and brainstorm on ideas uh, that can be reported about based on the data on uh, human rights measurement initiatives. So Kendi, so I want to facilitate. Thank you, thank you Talia. Uh, I, it's been very uh, uh, educating and all that. So uh, I just want to make some comments. Maybe they could come as questions. Another, I hope my background noise is not too much. Uh, I stay somewhere where there is a lot of noise. So it's not easy. So uh, I, I saw the data and I noticed that um, most of those data are based on sometimes what uh, the states, uh, the governments, uh, like statistics organizations applied to the UN and all that. Do you think uh, uh, there is a lot of credibility? I'm just thinking from data supplied from governments to UN as against uh, when you work with, um, I, I know you said you don't really work like directly with NGOs, I said, they submit those data to those organizations. So what's your thought on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, our scores are only as good as the data that comes in. Um, and it's certainly a good question to ask, is the data good that, that we're using? 
Um, my my overall impression is that the indicator the indicators that we're using um, are seen as credible by the international community. Um, some of them are supplied by the national departments of statistics, but some of them will be supplied independently as well. Like there's a, you know, there's a joint UNICEF um, something else reporting project. That's one of them, you know. Um, so some of it will be, I imagine, NGO staff on the ground. Um, so uh, my my impression from um, from the, I guess, from the experts who who have put this all together, um, is that the the data we're using we like we only use the data that um is credible and is widely accepted as being reasonably accurate um it is why we don't say that every country needs to get exactly 100 percent to be you know fulfilling its obligations um you know there's no there's no perfect accuracy there are a lot of places that errors could could come in along the chain um so we say countries should be aiming at you know around 100 percent um but uh, but yeah, overall, I think that um, that uh, the the data that we are using from the international databases is seen as credible. So um, so that that seems to be all right. It's definitely a question to ask. I'd love to hear other questions and other impressions. Thank you, thank you. If you have other questions and. Uh... From what she, if you listen very well to the presentations, the, uh, they are willing to work with us on uh, human rights data. So if you're working on a story, uh, you think you need assistance in working through this data, especially independent uh, journalists. And I know um, so a few organizations have like a data team that could analyze data and other things like that, but. Uh, a lot of organizations don't have that facility in Nigeria. So, and uh, I must uh, have to say that Natalia is friendly. So, <laughs> so you you get a good response. And she's so sweet. It's not because she's here, but I'm telling you that that's my own impression about her. So I can see Sharon is uh, shaking her head. That means they, she has the same impression too about her. So, the, she, the organizations, they are willing to work with us. So we also uh, try to share, I, although like she said, they may not be able to like to use some data, but we also intend to uh, connect or uh, tell them about uh, NGOs or organizations that are working, trying to collect data. It could be, it may not be a national data. It could be regional, it could be state, it could people their work so like um, there's an organization that i know that i mentioned uh civic um, um citizen gave they did uh, a data about justice reform i think which is under human rights too, in uh, i think in the southwest that's around Ibadan. so I'll, I'll try to get through to them and also share the data so that you need to under, also understand uh maybe it may be like for a background for uh, your own work to understand what is happening. I, I also know quotes for Africa, that uh, they are focused on Africa, talking about data. So they are good organizations that will, uh, I'll try, we'll try to see with Blessing. We'll try, so Blessing is a, is a one of data fellow. So she will be able to, we'll see how we could connect you with them. They, they work with a lot of data. They try to train journalists. And I know um, because so I, I noticed you also talked about the productive health, health. So we could also try to, maybe beyond this, we could also see it, it could be like uh, a, a connection, a meeting with NGOs that uh, try to collect data in one form about Nigeria. It could be especially in your thematic areas with human rights, else and others, so that you could understand, so they share what data they have collected and what you, you'll be able to see what exactly is happening about that. So I know you also mentioned, I, I, I'm trying to give time for my colleagues to have their questions, but I'm trying to also share my own thoughts too. I know you also mentioned that uh, uh, most times is not, uh, is about 
what the data is showing that the government is able to achieve. And I, I think there is a gap there, which is corruption. So if, okay, like uh, you, you mentioned that Nigeria could do a lot more. So and, uh, <laughs> the reality we don't, <laughs> it's all over there. The reality is that corruption is, so like for most times you ask, uh, people say, oh, they need, uh, the Nigeria needs more uh, investment in education, but you ask, so the investment they have in education, are they, that, that's, that's a, that, there is a lot of question about accountability, even at the local government level, at the state level, they, that's, uh, for that to really be able to, there needs to be accountability and open, open governance. So we have, so I'm trying to like give a feedback of what is happening here so that, so it also gives a thought for even as journalists, why else we write those are this. So when you look at this data, so what are the issues, what are the social issues that in Nigeria have to contend with? Uh, because like you said, you are supposed to be a lot better. You are supposed to be doing so well. So like uh, in health, so uh, thank God you said you will be releasing a report on COVID, uh, 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 COVID we said soon. So about COVID response. So in the start of the epidemic, we are thinking that uh, a lot of investment will work, uh, will move to the health sector and things will work better. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we have not, uh, from, our, from our own, it could be by our assessment, things are not, so we're thinking that, oh, before our government people, they could easily travel to get health, uh, health uh, uh, consultation in UK or anywhere in the world. So because of COVID, they co can't travel like that. So we are thinking that they, because it affects everybody, they will be more conscious and ensure that the S sector work. But unfortunately, it's not, it's, it's part of human rights. And when we also look about at uh, Mantana, uh, ma uh, ma sorry, Mantana else, Mantana else, that space too, because they are all under human rights. Is a lot of issue. We see how women die from childbirth and all those things like because of the state of our health space. So these are the social issues that forms the data. So I'm very sure my colleagues uh, will have an opinion at that, about that. I'm very sure, possibly. So I want to say, if you even if you don't have uh, a question, if you have comments about the social issues that we face in Nigeria and the human rights data, you are free to, uh, to add your comment to that. So blessing, I'm very sure you want to say something about that. So and I, you, you mentioned something about this disability uh, stuff. Uh, blessing does a lot of work around this, uh, people living with disability. She could be your contact person for that for Nigeria. Yeah, so absolutely. So colleagues, colleagues, let's, uh, let's say something. So before we round up for today, speakers, 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 um, journalists. Thank you so it's much, no Kendi. The more you talk about speak out, uh, speak up. What comes to mind is our okay. <laughs> and um, while while uh, Talia is trying to make us do at this point in time is okay. While we still share our questions or comments, she wants to see those ideas that we have. And how the data on right tracker can help each and every one of us to do our work seamlessly. Uh, we know that data, data is a new thing. It helps, it helps make your work easier and makes your story more, um, more interactive. People are able to relate with it. So while you're explaining and sharing stories with the data, you're able to put things in proper perspective. And that makes it take me to the point where uh, when Sharon was referring to, was taking us through the right tracker, and the part of right to food, where there's a decline from, I think, 2016, 2015, 2016, there was a decline. And I was like, hmm, so we understand what's going on. Is it about the administration in government in Nigeria or this and that? So sometimes we look at certain things in, in the public sphere. We know that these things are happening. We know what the issue is, uh, the issue that is ongoing regarding uh, the fuel high price and all of those things. But sometimes we are unable to, we're able to access the right data to support our maybe 
our beliefs or our perceptions, but if we have data that we can quote, that we can work with, it's really going to make um, our works easier. But by, by adventure, if we don't have um, specific story ideas yet that we want to share with, um, that we want to share with Sharon or with members of the community, Sharon has shared our email address uh, via the chat box. We could just um, share those, those story ideas. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can be um, modified to turn out to something good and something fantastic. And I know so many people on the call are those who are doing great and wonderful things with stories as journalists, even in the development sector. And it would be great to see uh, what we're able to do with all this, uh, all this data that has been provided. So I, I, I don't know if any other person has questions to share or comments, basically. Your perception about the data, do you think it's sufficient enough? I've been able to raise um, a comment about the disaggregation of the data, not just by gender, but also by uh, disability. So if you're thinking about this, a particular data, you're able to get it also based on various kind of uh, disaggregation. So you could have comments that you want to share on the data that has been shared with us, or you feel that um, there are certain things you would want to do with those 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 data. So basically, let's just share our story ideas. It doesn't have to be firm. It doesn't have to be perfect right now. Let's just share. Okay, then maybe we should start with you to share a story idea <laughs> that you would like to work with based on the data that has been provided. So since you have called my name, I can call other people. I can call Mr. Ni Oyedeji. Ni Oyedeji works with uh, an investigative uh, uh, media suite in Nigeria. Ni Oyedeji works with ICIR. He's still with, not was. He's still with. I say works with. Did I oh, oh, say works? Oh, uh, I work. <laughs> I'm protecting so, his interest. Ni Oyedeji, do you want to say something? Hello. Oh. Uh, let okay, me just, I guess. I'll respond to something, Candy, that you said about corruption. Um, I, I, I think um, so. The Human Rights Measurement Initiative, or, or HIMI, as we we call ourselves for short, H I M I. Um, we don't we don't say what the causes are of of the the gap between the forty point two percent and the hundred percent. Um, that's that's for you to you to say. Um, but exactly. when but when you say that um, that corruption is uh, is a likely problem, a likely cause, um, then I, I can I can tell you that um, that our data can be used as data of corruption. If if corruption is a problem in the country, um, then that will probably um, that will probably account for almost the entire gap, um, or certainly a lot of it. Um, because because the economic and social rights scores are a measure of how efficiently the government is turning resources into rights outcomes. Um, and there'll be different countries will have different challenges. Um, and so some countries will have low scores because um, there is a, you know, a neoliberal uh, government or austerity and everyone's cutting social spending. Um, and so there it's not corruption, it's ideology. It's deciding not to spend money on people. Um, and so, you know, for instance, in New Zealand, in my country, that's the problem. We, we, we don't have um, large problems with corruption, but we, we have just governments, one after another, have not invested in people. Um, and so our, our scores are, are embarrassing. Um, but in a country where you know that corruption is a problem, uh, then you could use our scores to say, um, here is the gap, um, you know, that, that corruption is having such an impact that it's robbing, you know, it's robbing this number of million of children of um, their right to education. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's good. So uh, I think uh, my colleagues would love to uh, reach out to you via email. So like she mentioned, you can also connect to her via uh, uh, LinkedIn. She's very active in that space. You can connect with her on LinkedIn. So and uh, for closing remarks, uh, I want to say uh, thank you so much to the organization, 
thank you for being friendly and open with us. Uh, we are looking forward to do more work with you, even as you seek and get uh, funding for Nigerian projects. Uh, we, we, we try to we'll stay in touch and uh, also see what we can do as we, uh, we go back to our own feed and look, uh, look at the quality data, uh, the quality of life for people in Nigeria, human rights abuse and all that. I will continue to give you feedback of what is happening so that you can also help with your work. We are so grateful for this opportunity. We are so happy. Uh, we, we thank, uh, and I'm very sure some other members of uh, the organization and the meeting are they? Are they on the meeting? Hello? As, as some other members of HRMI on the meeting. Oh, sorry. Um, with us today are just me and Sharon. Uh, we had uh, another of the interns was attending, but she's just left. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, would have, we would have loved them to introduce themselves so that uh, we know uh, we know them, and we can also relate with them, like we have been related with Sharon and Talia. So we hope that when uh, COVID and its problems are over, we'll be able to come to New Zealand and also come to uh, Kenya to meet with Sharon and uh, have some uh, African meals with her <laughs> and talk <laughs> African issues and all that. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So we'll continue to do what we do, improve and build capacity of human rights reporting and also collaborate with local and uh, international NGOs like the Human Rights Measurement Net uh, Organization. We are so happy and we we'll believe that what you have taught us, what you have, the insights you have shared to us will, be, uh, will make a lot of difference in the work that we do in Nigeria. And uh, we're also looking to be able to maximize the technical skills because beyond uh, underneath uh, data is a lot of work that we may not have the technical skill uh, to, to aggregate data. So, but we know we, we, we support from you, we can aggregate those data and do better in our work. Thank you so much. I don't know if Blessing has any other thing to say before we call it a day today. Um, it's just to thank, uh, yeah, I'm here. It's just to thank Talia more sincerely because uh, because of the time difference. She talked about a colleague who is already sleeping because it's extremely late at this time. It might be, uh, it might be convenient for Sharon who is in Kenya, but you find New Zealand, it's late already. So we appreciate you. And I think as a last night, Nigeria time, even before going to bed, I was trying to check with Kenny with this thing old because Talia felt ill and it was like, oh, what's going to happen to this? Uh, but we really appreciate your, your efforts to make this happen. Thank you so much, Talia. Uh, before I close officially, someone, Lukman, Lukman Nafiu, Nafiu, I hope I pronounced that correctly, as is and raised. Uh, I don't know if that's where he comments. Lukman, you can go on, please. Yeah, um, good morning from this end, uh, from this part of the country. Uh, look, my nephew is my name. I'm actually speaking from Osun State, a state in the uh, southwestern part of, of uh, part of Nigeria. I think we lost you. Or is it just me? Um, no, no, no. With, um, Look, man, we, Hello, we, am I on? Yeah, but we couldn't yeah, hear you for a while. But we got you yes, in. Okay. Yes, like I said earlier on, I work with um, for persons with um, disabilities, actually in a cluster head for one of the persons with a disability, and as well as the staff of the Rabino Foundation, um, an NGO that works for the administration of persons with admission. My question in, in, a, in, a, in, in one word is that how are persons with disability key into this kind of um, a program or um, um, so to say, meeting, so to say, thank you. How are we being involved? How are we, how are we key in? So, uh, look, man, I think, oh, sorry, please. I, um, I, 
Tane, I think I can respond to that. Uh, thank you so much, Lukman, um, for your question. Um, when we started the session, uh, basically, uh, Ermi was able to take us through, we have been taken through the uh, various data available on their network, on the website. And we addressed the major issues of persons with disabilities based on the available data, data provided. And uh, right. Talia talked about how they access the data and that the data are what are being provided, being produced across countries by different organizations, different countries and all of that. And uh, majorly those data are not being disaggregated based on, on the basis of disability, but oftentimes it's being disaggregated on the basis of uh, gender, male and female, and then that's what they work with. But he, she told us that uh, Omi is also trying to, Human Rights Measurement Initiative is also trying uh, to be deliberate about investing data of persons with disabilities to ensure that they are being focused in all of those issues. So we're not just saying male, female, and in disability, then we are blank. That has been addressed. And this is being organized uh, by Omi in collaboration with Human Rights Journalist Network. Uh, while we are trying to get people from who are um, just journalists, we're also trying to get people from the development sector. And we are trying as well as possible to also accommodate persons with disabilities who are even within the sector. At some point in time where we have, uh, there was a time we had sign language interpreter uh, in our midst during our program because we know we are accommodating deaf journalists in that particular program. So our program, uh, our trainings at different points in time accommodate once we know the date. Uh, those who are attending the program, we make a reasonable accommodation for everybody. So we are all inclusive as the Human Rights Journalist Network. And that's even the reason uh, the Human Rights Measurement Initiative has talked about the need to ensure that uh, they also get their data to engage and involve persons with disabilities. So yes, um, we're not there yet, but we know, we know the gap and we're working towards it. Thank you, Lukman. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful response. Thank you for the connections of the program, of this um, meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other remark from you, um, Talia, so we can then close the session for today. I, I'd just like to thank you all for your time and thank you so much to Kende and Blessing for organizing um, the session, for getting in touch um, make, and approaching us. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been really lovely to get to know you two as we've been uh, making our preparations um, and to uh, meet the rest of you um, in this limited capacity. Thank you all for giving your time this, um, this morning. Um, on the weekend to uh, to join and talk about um, how we can all be working to improve people's lives um, around the world and particularly in Nigeria. Um, and let me just say again that that we at Hermi are um, here to help um, and assist you in any way we can. Um, if there are ways that, that we could um, help make your reporting easier, um, then please get in touch. So um, my email address and other resources are in the chat box. Uh, do make sure you copy or take the links from there if you can. Um, and we will also send out an email. Um, I imagine we'll send out a, a newsletter um, with some links uh, through HRJN. Um, to follow up as well. Um, so thank you so much, all of you. And uh, I look forward to being in touch um, in the future. <laughs> thank you so much. So, Bye. so Sharon, as you say, thank you from Kenya. No, we, we, are, we can't go like that. <laughs> Hi, please allow me to introduce my sister. She's on the chat. Marianne. <laughs> okay. Marianne. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Hi Marianne. It's so nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. We Good love, job, guys. Jen. We love your sister. <laughs> uh, we are, I'm proud of her that um, she's doing amazing work in human rights. And I hope to support her because I also do human rights initiatives back in my village. And all the best, guys. <laughs> well, can tell us. You can you can say goodbye. Uh, thank you, Swahili. How we say it? <laughs> oh, okay. Asante sana. Asante sana. Yes, absolutely. Asante sana. I hope I get it right. Yeah, you can type it in the chat box. Can you type it in the chat box at least? We. Asante sana, Kenny. Ah ah. Yes. No, she, she type it in the chat box. I want so that we can have it at least. We are learning to. <laughs> How do we say it in Maori, Italia? 
Uh, we we um we use a greeting kia ora, and we use that for for thank you as well. So kia ora. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. In Nigeria, in Yoruba, they say Odabo. Who said that? Me. <laughs> wow. Sharon. Oh, that's impressive. That I don't speak Yoruba. <laughs> it, it looks like you have been watching too much, too much of Nollywood to be able to understand that. <laughs> and actually, I've been to your country before. Yeah, so somebody's just asking if this has been recorded, uh, and yes, it is being recorded. So, blessing, I, I assume that you will make the recording available and we will distribute it. All right, absolutely. Thank you, All everybody. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you, everybody. You. Bye. You thank you. Bye. bye for now. We can leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I usually stay on the call right to the end, but it's late here. So I'll say good night tonight and uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night, Talia. And good day to the Nigerians. That's right. And very well done, Sharon. And very well done, Blessing and Kende. Thank you so much. Good, good morning from Nigeria. <laughs> good day. Bye. A very good morning from this part of the world, though. <laughs> Oh, good to see you finally. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Enjoy the rest of the night over there. All right. Good night. Good day. Good night. Good day. Enjoy the rest of the night. Udaro from this time. Yeah. <laughs> okay.